Welcome to uh, this online session of the Sperry Symposium. Um, I very much wish that we were able to meet face to face so that we could have um, questions and discussions afterwards, but we'll do the best that we can. With the religions descending from Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, it is common to categorize them as either leaning toward the side of orthodoxy, correct belief, or toward the side of orthopraxy, correct practice, including religious requirements and rituals. While there are aspects of orthodoxy and orthopraxy in all of these, Christianity is often said to lean towards the pole of correct belief, particularly with a, a more creedal denominations, whereas Islam and Judaism are said to lean more toward the side of orthopraxy, the correct practice. With the revelations given to Joseph Smith, particularly those in the Doctrine and Covenants, the faith of the Latter-day Saints is grounded unmistakably in the, re the realm of praxis, of a religious life ordered for individuals and by the church through laws, principles, and above all, by covenants and ordinances. Clearly, there are elements of correct belief or orthodoxy, but these have their proper place primarily as they point us to Christ and how we come to him through covenants and ordinances. Indeed, with section 93 showing how Christ grew from grace to grace, receiving and returning grace to his Father, and how we worship by following Christ and through him grow grace for grace and come to the Father in Christ's name, and in due time receive of his fullness, the heart of our worship becomes discipleship, emulation of Christ. He is the way of our return, and any truth law, light, goodness, or holiness we find are subservient to, derivative of, and fulfilled in our heartfelt, whole soul discipleship of Him. Law, what God requires of individuals, of a people, of the church, the way He governs all of these, is an integral part of that discipleship, both because the law reveals what the Lord asks of His people, but also reveals the way Christ lived the way he is, indeed the way he himself is governed by his Father's will, and therefore what we are to seek to be like. Law is an essential aspect of the life of emulative worship. Significantly, section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants holds a high place for law, setting forth what law ha has the potential to do. Quote, that which is governed by law is also preserved by law and perfected and sanctified by the same. Those that allow themselves willingly to be governed by law will experience its preserving, perfecting, and sanctifying power. Conversely, for those who refuse to be governed by law, there follows inevitable and lasting consequences. That which breaketh a law and abideth not by law, but seeketh to become a law unto itself, and willeth to abide in sin, and altogether abideth in sin, cannot be sanctified by law, neither by mercy, justice, nor judgment, but will remain filthy still. The results of either allowing law to govern us, or to simply do things our way, couldn't be more stark, a condition of sanctification, or an ultimate state of filthiness. Significantly, the Lord lays out kingdoms of glory, degrees somewhere between these two poles in which one will inherit a kingdom according to his or her willingness and ability to abide the law of that kingdom. In section 88, the law is equated with light that proceeds from God's presence, lighting our eyes and understanding, filling the immensity of space, being in and giving life to all things and governing all. At least in some measure, what is being described here is the light or spirit that section 84 describes as being given unto all and enlightening those that will follow it and bringing those who follow it to God, even the Father, who in turn teaches them of the covenant. All are given this light, though of course one can reject the light or receive only a portion of that light according to what they are willing to do. Nevertheless, the Lord reveals the course laid out before those that receive his law or light. That which is of God is light. 
And he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. While the law or light described in section 88 governs all things, including the earth, the planets, the universe, it does not say that their obedience or the obedience of the cosmos is on the same level as that of human beings. Human beings, we, are agents who, having been given the law, can receive it or not, can say yes or no to it. In whatever way the earth is given law and governed by Christ, it is clear that the earth doesn't obey as an agent in the same way we do. It simply inevitably obeys, and as such fulfills the measure of its creation. Human beings, on the other hand, can receive or reject the law in varying degrees. As such, Christ is our law, the law that can save and sanctify us to the degree that we allow him to fully be our law by receiving and abiding, abiding in him. Scripture clearly testifies that Christ himself is a lawgiver and the source of law and that to which the law points. The risen Christ tells the Nephites that he himself is not only the one who was the lawgiver of the now, law, the now fulfilled law of Moses, but he is also the one who established the covenant and that they, as his covenant people, must know the ultimate relation they have to him. He tells them, I am the law and the light. A similar kind of thought to this, I am the law, is set forward in numerous places in which Christ identifies himself as the way, truth, light, life, and so on. These terms, each with its own nuanced meaning, are often used synonymously, particularly in section 88 of the Doctrine of Covenants. Where, for instance, the Lord says, The light which is in all things is that which giveth life to all things, and is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God. All of these come together and adhere in the person of Christ, revealing a Christ-centered foundation of Latter-day Saint Christology. Where the Christ of the universe, who establishes law and governs the cosmos, is likewise intimately revealed to individuals as the law that can govern their lives if they will let him. With respect to Christ being the law, I take this to mean he is ultimately that which we follow, or better said, the who, the person we follow, submit to, and are obligated or bound to. The law we follow, the truth we come to know, the light and life we experience, all of this is fundamentally Christ himself. This is perhaps best illustrated in the understanding Elder Bruce D. Porter came to one evening when, as a university student, he spent several hours one evening studying carefully and prayerfully the doctrine of Christ. In the process of this, he was overcome with the reality of Christ being the center of all. Quote, I received a pure witness by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, a living being, my friend and support in every time of need. Until that day, my faith had been centered in a set of principles and doctrines. From that day on, my faith centered in a living being. That testimony has been the guiding star of my life." Unquote. There is for Christ, as section 93 and other scriptures attest, the will of his Father to which he submits and to which we submit also through Christ. Our law is Christ, who serves as both an example and teacher of how to submit um, to the law, his Father, as a source for that law, as a savior for when we haven't kept that law, leading us through repentance as one who gives enabling grace and empowering us to live that law, who is himself, along with the presence of his Father, the reward for living the law. So our commitment and our life foundation isn't to an abstract something or other of law, truth, and so on, but to a person, a divine person. 
With Christ as law, the principles of justice, righteousness, mercy, truth, goodness, holiness, and so on, we find, a, uh, we find in them a perfect coming together of such realities, not by our independent work out of what would be the right mix theoretically, but these all find their full combined manifestation in Christ's person. His will, always one with his Father's will, is manifest to us in what is revealed in the written word, revealed by living prophets, and revealed to us as a church um, in the various ways of counsel and guidance, and to individuals through the Holy Ghost. All of these, of necessity, being given by the power of the Holy Ghost, which, as Nephi reminds us, speaks the words of Christ. The presence of the Holy Ghost in all of this is an essential in revealing to us Christ's will, the law he has for us. Because the law is spoken of in 88, in section 88, with reference also to section 76 and 93, is not simply a set of principles, stipulations, or independent governing laws or regularities, but the reality of and a relationship with the person, Christ, our response to law in this sense is a response to him. What governs all things is a divine person, more than an ordered set of moral and universal laws, though these may follow secondarily. In following the law of Christ spoken of in section 88, we come to not only know a divine law and way of being, but we come to know Christ. We come to know how the law and Christ are one even as we are made one with him. This deeply individual, personal aspect of Christ's interaction comes out most clearly when section 88 speaks in grand, cosmic language. Following the Lord's description of his being the light and law in all things, manifesting the, the wonder and glory of the universe, the sun and the planets and stars that move with each other in order, the Lord says, quote, Behold, all these are kingdoms, and any man who hath seen any or the least of these hath seen God moving in his majesty and power. I say unto you, he hath seen him. Nevertheless, he who came unto his own was not comprehended. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Nevertheless, the day shall come when you shall comprehend even God being quickened in him and by him. This magnificent universe is not simply something to awe and impress, though it does do that, especially in relation to the human being blessed to see these things with spiritual eyes. But in experiencing these things, we come to know the power of the creator and the sustainer of all this. as we come to experience our personal salvation. In seeing his hand and power in the universe, the Lord then indicates what we ultimately come to know. Quote, Then shall you know that you have seen me, that I am, and that I am the true light that is in you, and that you are in me, otherwise ye could not abound. The light and power, one day to be manifest with his person, speaks and works within us in our hearts intimately, clearly, and powerfully, causing us to flourish in spiritual life. My voice is spirit, my spirit is truth. Truth abideth and hath no end, and if it be in you, it shall abound. The notion of a real, personal, though thoroughly divine person in all of this is exemplified in the parable of the field and the laborers, a parable used precisely to help us understand what the Lord has said in section 88 about laws being given that govern heaven and earth and planets, their orbits, and they're giving life to each other, all of which manifest God moving in his majesty and power. In this parable, 12 individuals are sent to labor in the field, with each visited in turn by the Lord who sent them to labor in the field. And he said unto the first, Go ye and labor in the field, 
and the first I will, I will come unto you, and ye shall behold the joy of my countenance. And he said unto the second, Go ye also into the field, and in the second hour I will visit you with the joy of my countenance. The Lord sends all twelve, and then visits all in succession, from the first to the last. Quote, and thus they all received the light of the countenance of their Lord, and each made glad in that, that light. Every man in his hour, and each in his time, and in his season, beginning at the first, and so on unto the last, and from the last unto the first, and from the first unto the last, every man in his own order, until his hour was finished, even according as his Lord had commanded him that his Lord might be glorified in him, and he in his Lord, that they all might be glorified. The personal, individual care here for each by the Lord mustn't be missed. In the vast created universe, the Lord gives attention, one by one, to each that he sends. Then, to drive this home, those receiving the revelation and those who were present when section 88 was given, the Lord gives this for them says this to them, and in fact, um, says this to us. I say unto you, my friends, I leave these sayings with you to ponder in your hearts with this commandment which I give unto you, that ye shall call upon me while I am near. Draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. Seek me diligently, and ye shall find me. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, it shall be given unto you. That is expedient for you. And if your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you. And that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Therefore, sanctify yourselves, that your minds become seen with the God, and the days will come that you shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. The personal reality of spoken here is emphasized also in section 76 with the promise that the Lord will reveal the same things revealed to the Joseph, the, in the vision Joseph and Sidney received, granting others the privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves that they may be able to bear his presence in the world, world of glory. Similarly, in section 93, we read, quote, Verily, thus saith the Lord, It shall come to pass that every soul that forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me, and calleth on my name, and obeyeth my voice, and keepeth my commandments, shall see my face, and know that I am, and that I am the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, and that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the Father and I are one. These sacred promises are um, hallmarks of the restoration, which has as a key principle the teaching that a person can and must come to know God for him or herself. The purpose of all these promises of coming to know God are not, as Elder Packer said, to make us sign seekers. Verse 68 of section 88 gives us the clue here. Our effort should be to sanctify ourselves leaving the revelation to God. The Lord will take care of the how and the when of that revelation as he will. Another implication in all of this is that it isn't the law that saves a person, Christ that does. And this isn't just to say that the law alone can't save. Clearly it can't. We all fall short, not only with our sinfulness, but in our lack of actually being law-abiding in the highest sense. It isn't just that we are sinful, but that even should we be forgiven and set right, we simply aren't up to the divine attributes that the law requires. Even if we come to obey perfectly, something is missing if the law is an independent reality, not bound up in and leading us to Christ. Then again, if we see that Christ is a law, then in that sense, the law or Christ does save us. That may be the meaning we should take from verse 34. That which is governed by law is also preserved by law and perfected and sanctified by the same. 
Clearly, Scripture teaches that the law can't save us, and yet this passage says it is precisely the law which perfects and sanctifies us. Again, one way to achieve this, uh, or to resolve this seeming tension, is simply to read Christ as the law that saves. And the law, um, and the law he gives won't alone save us, only as it points us to him and we turn to him. Of course, the written, given law has a place. The Lord himself gives it to us, and it is one of the ways the Lord manifests his will to us. But it is, as its ultimate fulfillment, uh, sorry, but it has, as its ultimate fulfillment, the life-giving power in the relationship it cre creates with us and the lawgiver. We might see the given law as secondary to and an extension of Christ. It is the note left by a loved one on the table, so to speak that serves a real purpose as a communication from a real person. To have the effect it should have, the proper obedience to any divine law is a response to, obedience to, submission to Him, not something independent of Him. This high place for law is further emphasized in the following words from Doctrine and Covenants section 130. There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law. It would be easy to read this as a kind of self-sustaining law, independent from God, which one follows and gets the desired inevitable results. Um, I've even heard some people sometimes explain this as, uh, if you obey the law, God has to, to bless you, as if we have a kind of control over God and that that's what we're seeking. I think there's um, better ways to think about this. Some aspect of the law, of course, may, generally speaking, be true whether one believed in God or not. Society might look and say, it's a good thing not to kill, steal, lie, etc. We might note that Marital fidelity is good for individuals and families and society. Those things seem to be a visible, obvious good, whether individuals or society believed in God, was the, that God was real, and behind those laws or not. But the reality of God establishing divine law and himself being the law makes her a tremendous difference. With respect to section 130, to the passage read earlier, I might suggest that a better way to read that is not to say there is a specific independent blessing associated with specific behavior, but rather the principle spoken of is the principle of aligning ourselves with the will of, of God and then asking in faith under the guidance of the Spirit for that which in specific terms used in the scriptures is good, right, expedient and of not asking amiss because we are asking according to God's will. The principle underlying all of this is asking according to God's will, submitting to God's will, a will that will be made known unto us always according to the, Lord, in, to the Lord's own time and way and according to His will. Clearly, wonderful, even specific blessings come from following the law of marital fidelity, tithing, sacrifice, the word of wisdom, and so on. But whatever attendant blessings may come from those, that which underlies them all, the blessing we get from any true obedience, is found in being reconciled to God and the, bless the blessings that come, in good times or in bad, of being properly related to God in growing to know and be like our Father through our submission to and following of Christ. Our obedience to any law or principle is not experienced properly, is not true obedience, if it is not to the core an obedience to Christ as the law. All of the laws and principles of the gospel are wrapped up together in a totality of our discipleship of him. 
This understanding of Christ and law as law can also profitably inform a reading of section 88 and section 76 with respect to the degrees of glory and the conditions attending those glories, including those who have no glory. Significantly, the law of the celestial kingdom is said to be the law of Christ, with varying degrees of that law or light of Christ being present in each of the other kingdoms of glory. Section 88 explains that one inherits a kingdom of glory according to the law one is willing to abide by. If one will abide the law of Christ, the law of the celestial kingdom, one can inherit that glory. If one cannot abide that glory, that law, perhaps one can abide the law and inherit the glory of a terrestrial. If not that, perhaps one can abide the law and inherit the glory of a celestial kingdom. Those who cannot abide this law at all, those who are laws unto themselves and fully desire to abide in sin, are, quote, not meet for a kingdom of glory, but must abide a kingdom which is not a kingdom of glory. The latter, described as sons of perdition in section 76, will be quickened or resurrected to enjoy that which they are willing to receive, because they were not willing to enjoy that which they might have received. For what doth it profit a man if a gift is bestowed upon him, and he receives not the gift? Behold, he rejoices not in that which is given unto him, neither rejoices in him that is the giver of the gift. I take this notion of receiving what one is willing to receive or not from Christ to apply across the board to the various degrees of glory outlined in section 76. Indeed, one can say that these different glories respectively represent differing attitudes towards Christ, manifesting various degrees of light and law received and responded to from him. Sons of perdition are said to knowingly deny Christ's truth and defy his power. Quote, having denied the Holy Spirit after having received it, and having denied the only begotten Son of the Father after the Father has revealed him, having crucified him unto themselves and put him to an open chain. These do not simply turn from Christ, but as section 76 says, they deny the truth and defy his power. They deny Christ, they fight against him openly and knowingly. Those of the celestial kingdom reject both the testimony of Jesus and the gospel of Christ, saying they are some of Christ and some of Paul and Moses and Cephas, Christ's prophets, but not turning fully to Christ and his gospel, his prophets, or the everlasting covenant. Um, let me let me clarify, by the way, when we talk about these, um, all of these, when we get to the kingdoms of glory and it talks about them receiving and rejecting, it is in a final sense. Everybody um, will have opportunity to receive or reject. Um, interestingly, with respect to the attitude towards Christ and the celestial kingdom, the text reads, these all shall bow the knee, and every tongue confess to him, receiving a place in the mansions prepared, being servants of the Most High. There'll be an acknowledgement of the resurrection that they have from him, and also um, that he was the law, but they were not willing fully to receive it. There seems to be some acknowledgement and bowing the knee here, but as the text continues, where God and Christ dwell, they cannot come worlds without end. With respect to Christ and what is received of him, the terrestrial kingdom is said to be populated with those who receive the testimony of Jesus, either in this life or in the next, but who are not valiant in that testimony and do not receive the fullness of the gospel. The reception of the testimony of Jesus but not being valiant in the testimony, seems to mark those in this kingdom who are among the, um, the resurrection of the just and described as the honorable men of the earth, the kind of people, I take it, who you'd like to have be your neighbor. These are they who receive the presence of the Son, 
but not the fullness of the Father. There is a good deal of reception here, more than just acknowledgement, of the, like those in the celestial kingdom, of Christ here, of his law and light and of his person, but not a reception in, um, fully. In the celestial kingdom are those who, quote, receive the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial being buried in the water in his name, and this according to the commandment which he has given, that by keeping his commandments they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins, and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed under this power, and who overcome by faith, and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds, sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. Additionally, with reference to their relation to Christ, we read that those of the uh, celestial kingdom are the church of the firstborn, and that, quote, they are gods, even the sons of God. Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present or things to come, all are theirs, and they are Christ, and Christ is God's. And they shall overcome all things. Wherefore, let no man glory in man, but rather let him glory in God, who shall subdue all enemies under his feet. These shall dwell in the presence of God and his Christ forever and ever. We are also told that those of the celestial kingdom are just men, righteous men, made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out his perfect atonement through the shedding of his blood. Lastly, we read that they who dwell in his presence, and here the text refers also to the Father, are the church of the firstborn, and they see as they are seen and know as they are known, having received of his fullness and of his grace. And he makes them equal in power and in might and in dominion. Those in this kingdom, and certainly um, those in this kingdom have certainly followed him and received from uh, him grace for grace, as section 93 confirms. All of this is, of course, um, not only showing the path one takes to be with him, but also the re relation of oneness we've been brought to, uh, we've been brought into with him. To this point, much of this presentation has focused on the individual and his or her relationship to Christ. Of course, that individual is not an isolated being. Who we are is who we are with other people. We are instead members one of another, as Paul says. Indeed, the Doctrine and Covenant speaks of the Lord's people, a church, Zion, etc. Even the celestial kingdom as a place of a society with those being said to be the church of the firstborn and the highest degree of the celestial kingdom being the place to where we are told that family relations um, continue eternally. All of this, occur, of course, indicates that we must ask how the idea of Christ as law would play out in our more communal, ecclesiastical, familial aspects. I will touch on this briefly and admittedly inadequately. In a revelation given to prepare the saints' minds for the law the Lord would give, including the law of consecration associated with, um, with it, the Lord ex exhorts the saints to, quote, let every man esteem his brother as himself and practice virtue and holiness before me. And then, making sure we understand that he is no respecter of person, commands that the saints be one with the sobering de declaration that if ye are not one, ye are not mine. To the degree that we are one in righteousness, we collectively are his. And the degree to which we are not united, we aren't fully his. The law of God given to the church, including that given in section 46, but not restricted, uh, 42, but not restricted to that, sets forward the written law that should guide the church. Scripture, in general, lays out the commandments and the laws of God to govern his people. It is also clear, however, that the living God 
guides how that law is to be interpreted, giving commands, rescinding one course of action for another. While there is a, a written law in the standard works that, we, um, that are consulted and form a framework for making decisions, for coming to understand law, ultimately, the interpretation of that law rests not just on the best careful reading and understanding of the word, that is, in other words, something that should be sought, um, but the ultimate aim, as Elder D. Todd Grisofen said, after all the reading and discussion and counseling, um, is not simply knowledge, not simply consensus, but revelation, the revealed will of the Lord himself. Arriving at the stage where we come to ex experience the revelation requires a recognition of all, um, of all of the church being responsible for, for him. It's his church, in other words, and it takes our best efforts to put ourselves at one with him and with each other. Recognizing that we are fallible, the Lord admonishes the saints to receive Joseph's word as if from his own mouth in all patience and faith. We often interpret this to say that we know that our leaders are not perfect and so we must be patient with them, but receive what, they, what the Lord gives us through them anyway. There is truth to this. It's also true that in admonishing us to receive this impatience and faith, we are reminded explicitly that the ultimate thing we are obeying here is Christ. His being the ultimate word on things, his being the law, makes the reception of his servants something more than a recognition of them being the Supreme Court for interpretation um, of, for, of scripture for the church. There is something of the recognition of who they represent. He that receiveth my servants receiveth me. While this idea of receiving Joseph's word in patience and faith has clear relevance to how we receive his authorized servants, and while there is a special regard for those authorized servants the Lord sends, perhaps it might not be amiss to apply this general attitude to re our receiving each other in our meager efforts to be disciples of Jesus Christ, together in our various situations, in our wards, in our families, to respond to each other in patience and in faith. We ought to receive each other in love, knowing that each of us is individually accountable to Him, and that the Lord, who is your personal help and guide and Savior, is also just as much the Lord and Savior of the person next to you. Um, I testify at the end of this presentation of the truth of the Lord being um, the law for us. Um, and personally, the power, um, the help that it's been. Our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed our law who, if we will let him, will govern, preserve, perfect, and sanctify. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.